This is a book that folds back on itself. It's called A Fold in the River. And it started with poems and notes in the journal. It led to artwork, art, artwork that used some of those, those words, artwork with words folded in. And then I went back and, and wrote about Valerie's art and that bred more art and more writing. So at every stage, fold on fold, in, back into itself. But it starts in a real place, which literally is this fold, this bend, in the mid-course of the River Taff, just outside the village of Quaker's Yard. It starts where I and my wife lived for a few years in a cottage on the banks of the Taff. At the end of our garden was a beach, not a bathing beach, but a flood beach. And you can see a small vestige of it here. These are flattened, water-worn stones and all kinds of frankly rubbish. And that's what gave me the feeling that all human life is there. Certainly a lot of the life of the South Wales Valleys. A famous fact about the River Taff is that it's an uppity river. It rises very fast. All summer it lays on its stone bed, half the autumn too. Rain barely stirs it. Only up under the hills in the dark, long, centuries-long hall, weight shifts, the water table being laid, the not-yet-woken guests' cups fill, are filled, are running over. Then the day, a mead hall clamour, rain sheets off the fields, the glistening flanks, it spills into present time, smells sour, knows no bounds, remembers too much and will not be still. These are, are stones, ordinary stones you might think, though perhaps blacker than average. If you pick one up, if you weigh one in your hand, you, you realise not just ordinary stone. Some of them are very light indeed with bubbles of air in them. These are burnt out clinker out of furnaces. Others have that, that sheen in them and you think that's coal. This for hundreds of years was what these South Wales valleys were all about. A coal pebble. Greyish with a slight glint at one angle, not quite stone but oval and wafery, light to the touch. Skimmed low, it could walk on the water almost, right up to that panicky teeter at the end. It comes clean as from any other river, as if innocent, bland, black and innocent of what it did, what it left not just under the hills here, but under the valley. The deep navigation, past saving, sealed, filling with emptiness, drip by rising drip, like a glass harp, seance music, an inhuman purity of tone. A cave diver might yet stoop and crawl through the long sump, dragging his budget of air behind him, half astronaut, half minor of that worked out near unreachable inner space, peering into the night of the male soul, a lamp in his hat. Well, I thought I'd just start by talking about how um, Phyllis and I became um, involved in making work together and collaborating together. And that came out of uh, another project to do with a, with a seven this time, um, where I asked him for permission to use uh, some of his poetry from another collection of work called The Water Table, which is about the River Seven. 
and so that was in 2011 and we've been working together fairly consistently since then and he asked me to be involved in a book, a collaborative book of poems to do with the River Taff um, which had been commissioned by Seren Books and um, for that I decided to walk the whole of the River Taff even though um, the particular area where Philip was based, Quaker's Yard, there's a very very particular part of the river there where the river folds round the landscape um, but I wanted to get a feel for the whole river all the way from the source to the sea so in the company of another artist I spent a year just walking and drawing and photogra photographing things and reading the poems and just getting a feel for the river in different different times of the year different uh, river levels you know the amount of water in the river the river in flood the river just as a very calm rural river in the summer, very peaceful and um, so, and then that has generated a lot of the images, whether through drawings in the sketchbooks or photographs that I've taken that I've then incorporated or used as source material. And all of my work incorporates text in it, so it's quite difficult to see often from a distance. So this piece of work, um, Swamp Forest, is this is based at Quaker's Yard, where Philip used to live, and it's um, a river beach. But in, threaded into the image is uh, text from Philip's poems. And fortunately for me, he's quite happy for me to take his poems and deconstruct them and then begin to create new work from the pieces that I've taken out of them. And the actual technique uh, involved in this is um, it's a several stage process where the image actually breaks down so the image is created and then it's transferred onto another sheet of paper and in the process begins to break down and then I work over the top of it and sometimes I'll then transfer it again and that has a kind of um, quality of almost of um, some of the rubbish that comes out of the river things that are collected and um, that I then reuse. So there's a kind of second-hand quality to the images that reflects the nature of the river and how the river erodes and works on the landscape. Um, so this particular image is, I think, works really nicely in that sense of you, there's layers of things in the image itself, but that you can, and you can read it as a number of different layers. So um, just moving back, um, this piece of work. Um, Again, the image was um, taken down at Cardiff Bay, where, um, where the Taff leaves the bay and, and flows into the Severn, because of course the River Taff is a tributary of the River Severn. So, um, in a sense, this piece of work and one other, um, which was created from um, drawings and images taken down at that particular point, connect the two pieces of work. So the first piece of work, uh, Estuary, that I worked on with Philip's original pieces um, from his other collection, and this uh, book ourselves. So again, there's, um, uh, there's a kind of shimmer. There's, as you move past the pieces, the text comes into focus and then moves out of focus again, and then you come into another section. So it doesn't really matter which way you're moving through the pieces. Um, they change as you move through them. And what you can see reasonably clearly in this piece are these folds down the river. You can see those in the folding sketchbooks um, where um, I use those to go out and draw along the river because they have this sense that you can fold the whole book out and get a feel for the whole river or you can work on a double page spread um, and look at a, just a very particular individual space along the river itself um, and that has come through in all the artworks again it's part of the process of transferring the images they, they get laid down in sections and so you get these kind of fold lines that we've picked up and it, it echoes the, the fold in the river the actual physical fold in the river so that's why we went with um, that title for uh, the whole book and in fact, that was one of the poems that Philip wrote specifically in response to work that he'd seen in my studio. Because after walking the river and doing all the research and the drawings and the photographs and 
just thinking about how it's going to work with the subject matter. Philip would then come into the studio once a week on a Thursday afternoon and sometimes he would just sit there while I worked and he would do, do some writing and respond. Sometimes he'd wander around, pick things up and, and start playing with them and ask if he could take them away and use them. And then, um, and then he, would, he would write some more poems in response to coming in. So the Fold in the River poem was a kind of seminal point in the development of the book where he responded to the folding uh, sketchbooks that I was working in and we realised that the whole idea of working together was, um, ironically for both of us, as neither of us baked cakes, was like making a cake where you fold ingredients together and the, all the individual ingredients are then um, combined to create something that's completely new and, uh, and original out of those different elements. So um, just coming back to this piece of work, quite a lot of structures along the river. They haven't really appeared in the book, but um, this is from uh, Taft's Well, from inside the building where the Taft's Well is. And again, um, in, in, you get the fold actually in that building because the folds between the concrete panels around echo the, the fold in the pieces. Um, and I actually rather like this, um, again it's damp, there's a line of damp on the wall that kind of echoes the river. The river is actually lower than, than the, um, it doesn't actually come up to this level because the water in the, in the actual um, well itself is down here. But the water level in the river is not at that level, that's water rising through the building. And there are actually a number of poems, um, one of which didn't get used in the book, in fact, where um, Philip talks about buildings absorbing water and becoming part of the river. So, um, and again, I've, I've tried to get with the text, the text is a little bit more obvious in this one, but I've tried to get that sense that the text is beginning to melt into the plaster surface of the walls. So... So this is it, in it, its whole length, from the place where it rises up in the mountains of the Brecon Beacons to where it exits in the estuary at Cardiff Bay. And right in the middle, there is the fold, that small quirk in the river where everything slows down, banks up, including this artwork and these poems. The river is a tree that grows inwards from the tips of its twigs, sap reaching downhill until accidentally it finds itself, its others find itself, a trunk, a place to stand. This thing that can't stand still finds a foot in the ground at last that turns out to be sea. If you ask me how long this river is, I won't answer. There are answers that you can find, I'm sure, in Wikipedia. But just think, where does any river actually start? Doesn't it start almost everywhere inside its watershed? This is called reeling in the river. Enough now. Wind back the reel, spool in the river right up to the source, which is no one where, unless you hold it cupped in the all-angled lens of a raindrop. That, or the quivering globe of all this, for the most part, see. Scroll up the chattering brief brilliances and long abradings, sweeping up of everything that we let slip, murk dynamics that we might mistake for memory. Tease it back into finer and finer upstreams, unbraiding its locks, its neat or frayed seams, unpicked equally, winding its fibres as if any one might be the golden fleece, a child's first clipping in the tarnished locket, the micron-thin glittering hawser that, why are we drawn to say this, and so often, might stretch from the earth to the moon.
This is one of Valerie's folding notebooks. I, I was lucky to be working with an artist who, who knows the physical length of, of things as a walker who actually walks the entire length of this river. That means knowing that it never fits conveniently on first one page and then the next. So what better than working in this oriental form of the book that folds out to one unbroken length. When it folds back in, of course, it also becomes a lovely image of two sides, two art forms, which both are the same thing and utterly opposite, that they fold in with each other and become one book. This is folding the river. Don't tell me that it can't be done to fold the river. I've heard it on the nearly edge of night, suddenly loud between narrowing sides of itself, then shut as a book, mum. No more stories tonight, children. Even now and then, in daylight, you blink. The river concertinas, 30 miles from source to swerve to sump to sluice gate, glint to shadow, past to present. Like a secret we're all in on. We're all in. What could open a wide enough gaze to read us but a river? Or this, Orihon on mulberry paper as fine as closed eyelids. In ink made of soot and glue, the nested scroll could open this way, that, or both, each unknown to the other, or could leave it sleeping, fold on fold on fold. This is the place exactly where Valerie's working, walking notebooks are opened up and, and let me in. It's a straightforward line drawn ink map of that course of the river with the bend in the taff. But something else has found it, its way in here. And of course, in that deep, damp valley, it, it's water. So, with the water stain, what the ink does naturally is bleed outwards. And I saw that pattern of the, the bleeding darkness that comes out and takes root on the page, and maybe in our minds as well. I thought, that will let me in. And the first piece that I wrote directly to Valerie's artwork is this, the stain. It spreads. One touch of water and the ink lets go, as if the paper wants this physically. It bleeds like damp through plaster, as a worry dream you can't recall persists, a smudge print on the day. It stays like flood risk, like the once in a hundred years that always could be this year, shadow on your title deeds, coal stain on the hearth or heart, that nothing shifts, not suds, nor scrubbing, risings of the river, year in, year out, rinsings of the rain. What I love about these images is that they're so gloriously imperfect. They have that distressed look, very much like the river and the valley itself, and like it are also beautiful. There are bits that, that seem faded and, and, and ripped out, and that's actually done artfully by the way that images, partly made partly recycled the images have been transferred on and, and stuck and torn off. So they tear, there are bits washed up. 
There are words, there are odd lines out of poems that didn't necessarily start off with each other, but they meet here, left on the beach, after one of these powerful floods. It's the absolute power of that, that river to rise and remix things for us that I think is glorious. That's why it felt like the third person in this. There was the artist and the writer and the river as a personality in itself. What to do with it? The old muscle and wit with which the taff rises. Mad, bad pranks, extreme japes, anything. Like the kids who torch the bracken, leaving slim birch saplings ashen white and shriveled, just to make a mark. I found three bicycles, a rust contraption wrangling in the shallows, twisted into one another like a circus strongman's knot. I lost count of the draggled buggies that beached a while, then bumped by like a skeleton pram push, jolt by nudge for years, quixotic off to blight the views of Cardiff Bay. And the bikes? I waded in, all good intentions, tugged and slipped and swore, gave up on recycling, looked around, then kick them back to what the river wanted, wave them on their way. Praise song for the tap. Start by mistrusting the beauty of this hillside, smoother than it should be, green as a hospital sheet, stretched up tight to his jutting stony chin, the laid out giant Grand old bugger, half ogre, half rough you up and make a man of you, tough uncle. Don't let them trim quite all the stubble, not quite sluice away the phlegm stained black. Find someone, if there's anyone, to belt out something rousing for him, as he belted all and sundry in his day. And then, mistrust the river, its apparent clarities. The fish have come back, alive, alive, oh, with tidings that something has died. And the kingfisher, welding torch blue. The water, though, twinkles with forgetfulness of how the coal dust flowed, rimming the stone beach and the flood marks under bridges, right down to the bay, the swish of its shitty and muscular tail for miles into the Bristol Channel. Mistrust the sigh of emptiness, the quiet, the unbroached skyline, because any time now they'll need the buzzsaw snarl of petty biking, their scars on the hillside, Here's a posse, shiftily, of several ages round a torched tree stump on the waste ground, which is also beautiful, with gorse and slim tentative birch trunks and fat blackberries by the do not cross the railway sign with its danger of death, a well-worn path up to and from it either side. And last, Mistrust, mistrust, the need to be unfooled, uncompromised. As if any water you could drink was pure and might not rise against us, against toppled boughs dammed under bridges and its own back swelling. Nowhere anyone can stand is high and dry. Mistrust all that and yourself. And now consider just the possibility of praise. These are the very final words in the book. If there is a last word, this is it.
Why should you expect it to smile for you, this river? Grow up. New rains, a half metre rise, and the taff is murky, greenish grey and tetchy. A sour smell, too, slightly chemical, slightly tinged with mould. It's an unlovely river today. The last leaves falling, everything as naked as you've seen it. That's naked, not nude. There's nothing posed about it or alluring. In its least best angle, with its uncleared rubbish, too. Unlovely? It doesn't say, love me. Yet, you do.